flying in the face of global warming, the business and holiday flights that are damaging the Earth. Friends of the Earth say commercial jet aircraft generate more pollution than all the human activity in Africa. I'm Martin Stanford. This is Inside. Welcome to Insight. Air pollution from planes in Europe is set to rise by nearly half in the next two decades. Aircraft emissions of nitrogen oxides, or NOx, are linked to lung damage, and they've doubled since 1990 and are forecast to rise 43% by 2035. Airlines have reduced their planes' NOx fumes in the last decade, but the improvements are coming too slowly. Insight's Ty Genwright tells us more. Pack your bags and check in. Cleared for takeoff and then wait for touchdown. Flying's no longer a luxury pursuit. It is the only realistic way to travel long distances. The price has tumbled, but air travel still comes at an environmental cost. Five million barrels of oil are burned every day in the skies above us. Each person uses about one tonne of oil equivalent energy per year. Now, for example, to fly a full 747 from Heathrow to New York and back will burn about 300 kilos of fuel per passenger. Now, that is one third of the total energy used by the average person in a whole year. The figures are breathtaking. The most frequent flyers don't give it a thought. Flying is, is an elite activity. It's something which rich people do, um, and the effects of it will affect everybody, rich and poor. Curiously, the fuel burned by planes is exempt from tax under an international treaty written when the industry was in its infancy. And the pollution it creates has been left out of the recent climate agreements made in Kyoto and Paris. So why do you think this problem is being ignored? Flying is a great source of economic growth for countries around the world. Um, it's one thing governments can rely on to keep growing for the foreseeable future. Airlines have absolutely no interest in telling people that flying is bad for the environment. And if you want to travel long distances, uh, what are the other options? Airlines don't like wasting fuel, but sometimes they do. If fuel is cheap at a departure airport, they'll fill up with more than they need, even if the extra unnecessary weight burns more fuel on the journey. Alternatives to flying long distances are scarce in the extreme, and the potential to fly in a greener way is severely limited. Newer planes are more fuel efficient, but improvements so far aren't keeping pace with passenger growth. It's almost a decade now since the first commercial flights took to the skies powered by biofuels. A good idea in principle, but less so in practice. You have to look at the energy ratios in production of biofuel, and that is how much fossil fuel you put in to producing this biofuel. And generally speaking in the West, we have what's called a negative energy ratio. In other words, you use more fossil fuel energy in producing your biofuel. And the only reason they do it is to keep uh, the green energy lobby happy. Next year, Airbus will deliver the first of its EFAN planes, light aircraft powered by electricity. But in the sky, like on the ground, range and power are holding back electronic propulsion. It's unlikely that electric-powered aircraft uh, of any size um, or flying any distance will, will occur in our lifetime. So what can regulators, airlines and passengers do to reduce this pollution? The answer could be pay more tax or fly less. Hard sales to a society has become used to flying on a shoestring. There is though one idea how to compensate the planet at a price that does not cost the Earth. When they have to fly, when it's unavoidable, then perhaps they could consider buying a carbon offset for their flight. Generally costs around 3% of a ticket price. So flying from London to New York, you might be looking at an extra uh, 15 to 20 dollars on top of your, 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 your flight ticket. So it's not as much as people imagine it might be. 
Low-cost travel has changed the world. For some, getting on a plane is like getting on a bus. Budget carriers are now embarking on longer routes, saving travellers money today, but storing up problems for everyone tomorrow. Ty Genwright, reporting for Insight. Well, let's discuss that further. With me in the studio, I've got Simon Calder, a travel journalist and broadcaster, and Nick Coleman, who's the course leader for aviation management at London Metropolitan University. Um, welcome to the programme, then. Uh, the signs are, Simon, that we all want to fly more, not oh, less. Oh, most certainly, and that demand is largely coming from the developing world, particularly from Asia, and we could be, in 2017, hitting four billion passengers uh, in a year, which is absolutely unprecedented. Whatever shocks the world economy has, um, there is just this relentlessly upward trajectory. The trend graph just yes. goes up and it, up and it up. It keeps going. We, we are uh, addicted to flying. And with the source of fares that are around, there's no, no reason why we wouldn't be. Um, ten years ago, for instance, just taking a, a city pair, Istanbul, the largest city in Turkey, and Ankara, the capital, of course I would always get the bus or maybe the train between them. Now, um, three flights an hour typically, uh, fares as low. I was just checking for tomorrow, $15 one way. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity, but of course it comes at an enormous environmental cost. Um, and that growth in flights in terms of the business model, Nick, for airlines seems to be working too. They seem to be, as Simon was alluding to, be able to offer more and more services. Yeah, um, an interesting aspect of this is hybridization of airlines. So airlines are changing uh, to fit customer needs. So the traditional airline uh, caters for a vast range of different types of passenger, customer, um, which is a good thing because one of the themes about this is, is, is making use of aviation and, and getting load factors up. So the traditional airlines have learned from the low-cost airlines how to fill aircraft and they're now being very brilliant with e-commerce and e-sales and e-marketing, which is a very good thing. We don't want aircraft flying light of passengers because that's a terrible waste. OK, so they're getting better at filling the aircraft so they fly full or, you know, with only one empty space or something in the whole thing. That's a good thing, yeah, and that's, in, that's improved, in, and improved as, as the traditional airlines have learned from these innovative low-cost airlines, Ryanair's and... Easy jets, etc. Okay, and the low cost, as we're dealing with them, Simon, they are now a phenomenon just not in Europe um, and America, but they are a worldwide phenomenon now, are uh, they not? Most certainly. Um, that they have just unlocked aviation for everybody. They've democratized flying, and particularly in uh, large countries such as China, um, there is a vast amount of. of growth because previously of course people would spend days traveling across the country by by train now they can cover the same distance for probably the same price by air now what china is doing of course is putting into place an extraordinary uh, high-speed rail network and that i think is one of the possible solutions um, aviation has kind of got away with too many things for too long one of them is if you have got a city pair like Beijing, Shanghai, like Ankara, Istanbul, uh, like um, London to Amsterdam, you really should be running high-speed trains rather than the very large number of aircraft that are flying between them. Are they really paying the true cost? As we as passengers on these, are we really paying a true cost or is somewhere we're being subsidised? There is so much that could be done with taxation, as I think Ty Genwright's uh, uh, report highlighted. For example, um, leaving the UK, you pay about $15 uh, for a short-haul flight, uh, maybe $100 for a long-haul flight. Um, that's fixed. It doesn't matter whether you're on an incredibly full very efficient modern aircraft or whether you're on a half empty old jet which is having twice the uh, environmental impact so various uh, models would for example incentivize the airlines to fly fuller or to cancel half empty flights and that is if you just say we're taxing the flight the departure regardless of whether the seats are filled. That is one of the many things that could be done, but there's a list a mile long. You, I mean, Simon alluded to the, to the uh, promo deals. Often, mm. the, pro, the flight cost is negligible. I mean, it's, it might be free, but it's only the government taxes you end up paying. Yes. Well, um, That's not sustainable, is it? Who's <laughs> actually paying for that in the long run? Well, I think I'd just like to come back to the point on rail. I mean, I, I'm surprised to hear the success of railway when in this country right now we have so many problems with the railways, which are subsidised mass massively by taxation through us. 
airlines don't rely on that source of revenue at all. So I, I don't think, I mean, when we look at why has aviation grown so much uh, domestically in the UK, it's primarily because our railways are not providing the sort of long distance services that we need. And therefore people are using uh, air travel. But as for taxes, I mean, aviation has, I would admit, been fairly fortunate in this area because of the Chicago, Chicago Convention, where airlines agreed that they wouldn't impose governmental taxes on each other. This was uh, a global industry. We would not have got to where we are today without this huge cooperation, huge professionalism, and basically we have a wonderful industry that wins. And professionalism. So well, you're, you're no, I, would, I would say mm. malpractice, as, as Ty Gainwright referred to. There is this practice which is called tankering, which is where, for example, on some Greek islands, fuel is very expensive. So therefore, people will arrive with uh, fuel that they've carried in their tanks at considerable uh, financial and economic uh, and environmental cost in order to save money on the fuel there. Um, there's huge improvements that could be made in the uh, flying actually in straighter lines and in the stacking that takes place over Why the Why don't they airports. fly straight lines at the moment? Because air true. traffic control is rooted in the 1950s. Um, it really is. And there's some work going on. And, and I must say Britain is, is, is fairly uh, at the forefront here. But we also have the world's most congested airport, Heathrow. And right now, there will be 747s flying around over um, the area of southeast England, burning up fuel at 50% more than the rate they do when they're cruising. It's, uh, and that is, that is a permanent problem which technology has not yet enabled us to solve. So obviously the benefits in terms of the cost, the benefits in terms of less pollution and stuff, if you could get more efficient uh, egress and exit and stuff from airports would, would, would be uh, to everyone's benefit. How geared is this, Nick, to the fact that oil the source of airline fuel, that's me, is mm. relatively cheap. I mean, if oil mm. goes one and through, it spikes again. Does all this cheap flying stop? Um, I don't think it can now. Um, one of the things that uh, the industry has to live with is the unpredictability of, of jet fuel. Um, and of course, the and they have to factor that into their business model. Absolutely. Um, yeah. right, the last big spike in 2007 8 re resulted in uh, the US uh, industry being on its knees with all the majors mm. claiming Chapter 11. The thing about what we've got with aviation, we have got very marginal um, profitability in the industry. In fact, um, some people would say it's a zero star industry for profitability. It's airlines do work on the margins. What do they mean by zero star? Um, <laughs> Michael Porter um, came up with that expression uh, for investment purposes, for profitability. He, right. he said, forget airlines, invest in Coke, invest in FMCG, fast moving goods. I mean, I always take issue with that. I mean, the fact of the matter is there are profitable airlines, but it is an extraordinary industry. It's so capital intensive, it's so labor intensive, and then you've got jet fuel, which is a... A um, variable on top of that. Absolutely. And just while we're talking on the demand side, um, Simon, I see that um, Mr. Branson and his clever ideas trying to bring back a Concorde-like plane. Yes. going to do a transatlantic flight or another major flight in only three hours. Yeah, this is, this is called boom after the um, uh, noise that is made when the sound barrier is broken. Um, yes, it would be for many business travellers a fantastic thing to allow you to cross the Atlantic mm -hmm. so swiftly once again. But the environmental cost of an aircraft like that per passenger is way above an efficient modern aircraft like the uh, uh, Airbus A350 or the Boeing 787. And it also, that touches on something else, the easy availability of executive aviation. Business jets flying around, largely untaxed, um, they can be carrying one executive thousands of miles at immense environmental cost and maybe if it was really expensive for that to happen they might say oh look I'll, I'll, I'll slum it in first right. class across yes. the it's Atlantic. about affordability at the end of the day yes. isn't it okay well let's discuss that again when our program continues uh, you're watching insight with toxic air pollution threatening some of the world's global cities we'll look next at what can be done to help the world breathe easier